This video is going through the process of forward and backward scanning for project networks, enabling us to find minimum completion time as well as float times and critical paths. So a quick reminder of what project networks are. These are a visual representation of a series of activities and the um, order in which or the sequence in which they must take place in order to complete an overall project. So the main reason that we would organise these activities into some sort of network um, is so that we can identify uh, how long it takes to complete the project, considering all of the um, predecessors and in which order or sequence that the particular jobs or activities need to take place. It also helps us to identify any points that um, would allow for delay without delaying the overall completion time, but also any points where there is no delay and therefore they would be critical points. So a couple of definitions. When we're talking about the minimum completion time, we're talking about the time required to complete all of the activities in the project. And that minimum completion time is the longest sequence of activities throughout the network, but we'll talk more about that later. The critical activities are those that must be completed um, in the allocated time in order to complete the project by that minimum completion time. So that means there cannot be any delays if the time taken to complete that a critical activity is longer than what was expected, so longer than what the duration stated um, on the network or in the precedence table, then that would mean the overall completion time would also be delayed or increase. And so the longest path from start to finish is what we call the critical path through that project. And that is equal to that minimum completion time. So you're actually able to identify that minimum completion time by inspection, um, but we will look at a process that allows you to find that. Any activities that are non-critical, so they're not part of that critical path or paths, um, are ones that can be delayed. And depending on the length of delay, um, they may not impact the overall completion time. And so it becomes important to think about what we call the float time or slack time for those activities. So that's the amount of time that that particular activity could be delayed without impacting the overall completion time. So the process we're going to look at now is a way of identifying those critical and non-critical activities as well as where those points of slack or float time are. When finding our critical path, as we said, it could just be by inspection. So if we know we, that the critical path will be the longest sequence from start to finish, looking at this very simple network here, we have one option going activity A, B and D and that pathway takes a total of 3 plus 2 plus 3, so 8 units of time. There's also a second possible pathway or sequence of activities, A, C, E and that pathway 3 plus 5 plus 4 is equal to 12. So the longest pathway from start to finish would be our critical path and also our uh, minimum completion time. So for this particularly simple network here we can see it'll take 12 units to get from start to finish and the critical activities are A, C and E. That means that B and D have some float time associated with them. It's rare though that we actually work with by inspection. And so we have a process um, called forward and backward scanning to help us with more complex critical net or project networks and identifying those paths. So forward scanning is a process of identifying the earliest time that each activity could start in the project, taking into consideration all of the predecessors. Backward scanning is then a way of working from the finish back to the start and identifying the latest time that each activity could commence. And where the earliest time and the latest time are equal to each other, that means we have no float, no slack time for that activity and therefore it's a critical activity. So in the next couple of slides I'm going to go through the, 
the process or the method that I use for this forward and backward scanning, all of the methods are um, exactly the same. It's just the notation that differs. So this might be slightly different to what you've seen in your textbook or what you've been taught, but the actual process itself is exactly the same. It's just the notation that differs. So starting with forward scanning. As we said, this is a way of identifying the earliest start time for each of the activities, taking into consideration the predecessors. So how long has it taken to get to that start point anyway? We um, are going to note the earliest start time at each vertex, starting with a start time, obviously, of zero. Okay, I say obviously, but it is important to note, yeah, we will start when time is zero. So before I begin that, what I do working through is I put what I would call a double box on each vertex. And within this double box, I'm going to note down two things. In the left hand side, I'm going to note down my forward scan earliest start times. And in the right hand side, I'm going to note down the latest start times, which is my backward scan that we'll do in the next step. So for now, I've got all of my set up my boxes ready to go. And so starting at the beginning, I like to work in one color moving forward and a different color working backwards because in a more complex network, it can get quite busy in the working phase. And so having those different colors can help you keep track of what's going on. So green for going forward, I start, as we said, with an earliest start time of zero. And so I'm going to work my way along all of the possible pathways, accumulating the time, the durations that have passed. So from the start, if I complete activity A, I will have taken two units. So let's say for the sake of um, consistency, we're in hours, the time is in hours here. So from that point at the end of activity B, oh, sorry, activity A, if I then continue along and complete activity B, I've now got two plus three, which is five hours, which have passed. So I'm always adding on to that previous earliest start time or that previous um, forward scan value. If I continue along this pathway and consider activity H, so five hours have passed, H takes six, and so therefore that will be 11 at that vertex. The problem here is both H and G are flowing into that vertex. And remember with your predecessors, I cannot commence until both H and G have finished. So whilst we would like to start after 11 hours, we may not be able to. We have to consider both of those pathways coming in and we can only go forward with the largest value. So let's go back now to the vertex where we've got two after activity A has been completed and we'll go through activity C. So two plus five for activity C would give us seven. So an earlier start time for activity E is seven. And then seven plus three for E would give us 10. But again, I've got two paths coming in here. So I also need to consider before F can commence, D and E both have to be finished. And so we need to check, well, what time after how many hours can that happen? So going back for D, it can start after two hours. So two plus four for D would be six. Now I can say safely that 10 would be the earliest that activity F can start. So I put the number that I'm working with in the box. So I'm still noting down both of the possible values there on the edges. However, I take the largest value to move forward with. So now I can say F can commence after 10 hours. F will take six. So that's 16 here. So the start time for G is 16. G then, 16 plus four would give me 20 at this point. And again, I'm considering both those pathways in. So I cannot start until H and G have both finished. And the um, earliest that I can commence is now 20. 
Okay, we have to wait for both of them to be finished. Um, and now the overall completion time, 20 plus 5 for I, gives me 25. So at this point, my forward scan is all that is required to identify that um, overall completion time. So the project will finish in 25 hours. The key thing is where more, two or more of those activities come into the one vertex, we need to consider both options, but only move forward with the largest of those earlier start time values. Now we look at the process of backward scanning. So this is the process of starting at the finish and working our way backwards through the project network and identifying the latest start time for each activity. So this allows us to identify the critical activities and therefore the critical path, as well as um, any float time. So to begin, at the finish, we take the same time. So the completion time at the end becomes your starting point for your backward scan. And now as we move backwards through the graph or through the network, we're going to subtract the times or the durations of each activity. So we have the finish time of 25. I has a duration of five, meaning I can start at the latest at 20 hours. And if I started at 21 hours, I wouldn't meet that completion time of 25. So that's what this later start time is giving me. Here though, if I work backwards from 20 and consider activity H, so 20 minus the duration of six says that H can start as late as 14 hours and still not impact the overall finishing time. So we're thinking here, yes, it can start as early as after five hours, but it also could start as late as after 14 hours and not impact or have any um, delay in the overall completion time. Whereas we look at activity G, if we're saying we're starting at 20 or our time point is 20 minus the duration of four for G and we get 16 hours here. So G can start as early as 16 and as late as 16 in order to keep the whole project on time. So that's a little um, hint there that G will be a critical activity. Let's keep moving backwards. So from G, we've got 16 minus six for F gives us 10. 10 minus three for E gives us seven. And seven minus five for C gives us two. However, I'm going to pause at this point because at this vertex here, we have activities B, C and D all leaving that point. So when we're working backwards with our backward scan, we have to consider all three of those pathways coming back into this vertex at the end of activity A. And so but we need to be really careful where we've got those multiple activities coming backwards into that vertex. And so this is here again, we consider each of the pathways moving backwards. It's more important here to ensure that you do note down those late start times on the edges, because when we're asked for individual activity later start times, it's not the value in the box that we will continue to move backwards with. It is the activity that's noted on the individual activity edge. So here I've said C has a later start time of two. D would have a later start time of 10 minus four, so six. And activity B would have a later start time of 14 minus three, so 11. To, in order to keep moving backwards though, to finish off my back scan, I take the smallest value as my focal point. So two goes in the box to help me keep moving, but I'm not going to ignore those values there if I need to come back to them later. So to finish off, two minus two for A gets me back to zero at the end. Now it's really important to note if you've done your backward scan correctly, you should end up back at zero. So you should have double zeros in those boxes at the start point. 
If you don't, that's a bit of a flag for you to check that you haven't made an error along the way. Our final step is then to identify the critical path. So as we've said, critical activities are ones where the earliest start time and the latest start time are equal. There is no slack, there is no float time. And so the critical path is the sequence of those activities from start to finish. So if we go from the beginning, A is obviously the only option as the first activity. Here then when we could go B, D or C, we're looking for that edge, that activity that had the um, latest start time of two and that was activity C. And we're wanting to connect in all of these boxes that have the double numbers as the same, the earliest and the latest start time are the same as each other. So easy on the option to move forward from here, as is F, then G, then I. So our critical path in this case, when we write it down, we just write the sequence of edges as we see them. We don't need to write down the word start and finish. It is implied that if you're writing activity A is the first activity that, and it's commencing from that start vertex, it's implied that that's where we're starting from. Same with I and the finish. If it's the last activity you say, then we assume it ends at the finish line. Let's now look at an example where we can do all of that process um, together. So the construction of the new reptile exhibit is a project involving nine activities A to I. The directed network below shows these activities and their completion time in weeks. Firstly, what is the latest start time in weeks for activity B? And then secondly, write down the critical path for this project. So in order to find the latest start time, remember latest start times refer to your backward scan. So in order to do that, we need to go through our whole process. So let's set up and then we can work our way through. First step is to put our double boxes on each vertex. So just quickly popping those in. The purpose of these boxes are, is just really to help you keep track when something becomes a bit more complicated. Um, but I advise you to do it each time. It does just help if you're in that habit, then when you get something more challenging, you're not um, then trying to remember how to organize the information a bit better. Okay, so beginning with our early start time at the beginning of zero, activity A, duration of three, coming across to E, now I have both E and F coming into this point. So I'm just going to note down that activity E would give us a value of 10 there. So going back to the beginning, I've got activity B, but also C coming into this point. So I'll make note that B would give me a five here, but activity C would be three plus four, seven. So largest number moving forward before D can commence, I'm at seven. 7 plus 6 for D would be 13. And so now I can do activity F. So 13 plus 3 would give me 16 there. So again, the largest value moving forward. G can commence when they're both done. So that gives me 16. For G, 16 plus 5, 21. And again, considering H coming in here. So 13 plus 7, 20 for activity H. 21 is the largest value, and so I can commence. 21 plus 4 gives me 25 weeks at my finish point. Now my backward scan. So same process, working backwards. So I begin at 25, and I'm subtracting the duration now. So 25 minus 4 gives me 21. For activity G, 21 minus 5, 16. And coming back along E here, at this point, I've got both activity E and C leaving that vertex. So just noting down E at the moment, 16 minus 7 would give me 9. Coming back to the 21 boxes, so let's look at activity H. 21 minus 7 would be 14, but I've also got to consider activity F here. So 16 minus 3 for F 
13, and where I have two options, I take the smallest value, so 13 there, moving backwards. 13 minus 6 for D would be 7. So now activity C, 7 minus 4 would be 3. And of those two options, 3 is the smallest value, moving backwards. 3 minus 3 for A would give me 0 here. And also B, so 7 minus 5, 2. So here I have 0 at the start again, so that means I've hopefully done it correctly, working all my way backwards, no calculation errors. Now the first question, what is the latest start time for activity B? That's where it's really important that we've written those values on the edge because the latest start time is your backward scan value for that activity. So it's not what we put in the box. So in this case, the latest start time for activity B is two weeks. Our critical path, so again, remember that's the sequence of activities from start to finish where there is no float time. So from the beginning, A was the activity that gave me the zero as the latest start time. C was the next activity that gave me the lowest start, latest start time. From here, D is the only option to move forward. Now F gives me the 13 that went in the box. G is the only option, I is the only option. So now when I have to write down the critical path, I just write that sequence. So A, C, D, F, G, I. Now you may want to put dashes in between the letters, that's okay, but it's not expected. You can just simply write the letters um, out. But I know we're, we're kind of used to doing dashes from some of the other work in the networks module. We've talked a little bit about float time throughout um, the first part of this video, but just to have a, a more um, in detail look at it. So the float time, as we said, is for any non-critical activity or in ac actual fact, any activity, um, looking at the difference between the individual activity, early start time and later start time. So making sure when you're we're looking at um, finding float time that you are referring to the latest start time on the activity edge. So this is the completed forward and backward scan from the first example we worked through. And so if I was to list the um, float times for each of the activities, so if I look at activity A, my float time there will be zero. Okay, we know it's a critical activity, but also the earliest and latest start time, and remember we're referring to the vertex, at the start, the difference between the uh, pink and the green number, the latest and the earliest start time is zero. Then when I look at activity B, so for activity B, my latest start time was 11, the earliest start time was two, so that means the float time there is actually nine. So I've got nine hours worth of delay that could happen without impacting that finish time of 25. Activity C, we had a later start time of two, earlier start time of two, so it is a critical activity, has a float time of zero. Activity D, we had our later start time six, earlier start time two, and so a float time of four. Activity E, float time of zero. Activity F, we had um, float time of zero. Activity G, again, float time of zero. H, we had earliest start time, sorry, latest start time 14 minus five, so float time of nine. And activity I, float time of zero. So remembering that your critical path, any of the activities on that critical path should have a float time of zero. For this final example, that knowledge about float times and the critical path can be really useful. So in this example, we could be tempted to do a full forward and backward scan to help us work out the answers to the questions. 
However, we should be able to work out the information by looking at the table that has been given to us, which is containing for us instead of predecessors, it's giving us the list of earliest and latest start times. Um, coupling that with the diagram, the network that we've been given. So all of the activities and their durations in a project at the quarry are shown in the network diagram below. The least time required for completing the entire project is 30 hours. So that is our minimum completion time. For each activity in this project, the table shows the completion time, the earliest start time and the latest start time. So our first job is to complete the missing times in table one. So we need to find out what is the completion time of activities D and K. And so we can see those as empty boxes on the network. We also need to find out the latest start time for activity A and activity F. So before I do the latest start times, let's get our completion times and then let's think about how we can utilise our critical path to get those latest start times. So firstly, if the entire project takes 30 hours, what that does tell us is that my value at the end is 30 and I can see from the table that K has a earliest start time of 30, uh, sorry 18 and a latest start time of 18 as well. So that means working backwards that the value at that point, the latest start time value would have been 18. So 30 minus what? gave us 18, 30 minus 12. So the duration of K is 12. Similarly, with activity D, if we consider where D um, starts and ends. So even if we just draw the boxes to help with the visual here, we're told that D has an earliest start time of five. We're also told that H has an earliest start time of nine. So in order to get from five to nine, that tells us that the duration of activity D must have been four. Because remember working forward, we're adding those values. Similarly, we could look at um, the latest start times of H and D and do the same process. So if the latest start time of H was 13, meant 13 had to go here, and latest start time of D um, is nine, so that would have been the value on the edge. So again, 13 minus what would give you nine? It would have to be four. So we can double check those. Now thinking about the latest start time um, missing values. So any of the values in the, um, sorry, anywhere in any of the activities that have an earliest and latest start time that are the same are critical activities. So if we just isolate those, that means that B, C, G, J and K must be critical activities. So let's see if that forms a path through the graph from start to finish. So, oh, sorry, and I forgot, I missed E there. So activity E. So B, C, E, G, J, K gives me that critical path. So then when I look at activity F, I need to find the latest start time there. Let's do similar to what we did with activity D. Let's think about what happens here to get me back to the start of F. So activity I has a latest start time of 16. So we have 16 in the box there. Make that easier to see. Sixteen minus six for F 
would give me a latest start time of 10. So a value there of 10 for F. What about activity A? So again, thinking about this um, end point of A, because we can already say that activity E is a critical activity, it had a latest start time of seven. So that would have been the number that went in the box on the backward scan. And so seven minus the six for A would give us a later start time of one. And so again, we can fill that into our table. So we had to do some of that scanning work. We had to use our understanding of scanning to fill in those blanks, but we didn't have to do the whole thing. However, you might find that um, it was a little bit challenging to follow. So you did want to just, once you worked out those durations, those missing points, just do a full forward and backward scan um, to be able to fill in those latest start times. Finally, it's asking us to write down the critical path for the project. So if we go back to our previous page, um, we can find, we've already highlighted that from the table. So again, just recapping how I did that, our critical path will be any um, activity where the earliest and the latest start times are equal. So there is no float times there. And so running through that sequence, we've got B, C, E, G, J, and K. And so writing that down, B, C, E, G, J, and K. That's it for this video. So this process of forward and backward scanning really need to practice so that you become quicker at it. And then when you get a challenging question, no matter how challenging the network appears to be, following that process and making sure you're noting down the information in, in a um, systematic way will mean that you should be able to achieve um, the answers, should be able to find them. Good luck.